Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, it feels quite emotional uh, to close Cultures in Conversation a project today with, um, as it culminates with Water Week. Uh, as part of the program for People and Planet here at the Expo, in partnering with Expo 2020, we brought some of the world's leading thinkers and practitioners to help us reimagine and address um, some of the most urgent and critical contemporary issues we are faced with uh, in the world of Anthropocene today. Our intent uh, for cultures in conversation was to create a condition for learning uh, and change through alternative pedagogy. It is with epistemic approach that we studied these complex issues from radical, scientific, artistic, and humanitarian worldviews, revealing their inseparability from social, economic, environmental, and political spectrums. We've been collectively and actively engaged with over 60 participants over the past year. And as we deconstructed paleoclimate archives for Climate and Biodiversity Week, facilitating intergenerational debate, as part of Urban and Rural Development Week, we problematized and reinvestigated epistemologies and ontologies applied to cities today uh, by highlighting cities off the map um, and focusing on multivocality of the urban and possibility of community pertinent to our region. We learned to read the stars with artist and poem Nujum al Ghanem as part of Space Week. We danced through global goals together with SEMA Performing Arts Studio and collectively reimagined key ingredients for future of food through Pecha Kucha format. While it is impossible to mention all of the highlights uh, of Cultures in Conversation, I cannot not share my personal one. I still recall the conversation between Her Excellency Noor Al-Kabi, the Minister of uh, Culture and Youth, and His Excellency Zaki Naseba, a former Minister of State and current uh, Culture Advisor to the President of the UAE, uh, moderated by Mir Nayad were stories uh, we've never heard before, that were never shared with the public before, uh, were, were shared, and, and really new narratives through informality um, were drawn uh, in challenging uh, the meaning or definition of tolerance as part of Tolerance and Inclusivity Week. And to this day, I feel quite uh, privileged to have been part of that conversation. All this in search of co-evolutionary radical forms of change that can shape platforms of cooperativism, allowing for a broader investigative discussion, reimagined approaches that spill beyond political prescripts. We hope the fundamentals laid out over the past six months will allow for continued research, reimagination, and change with all of you in this room and beyond. With that in mind, uh, we have worked on creating an archive that will provide continuous access to the concepts, ideas, and research uh, that the participants involved in this program have produced. Cultures and Conversations archive components will continue uh, to be accessible on both uh, Expos and our virtual platforms, um, leaving a tangible, indelible trace of this program. I want to thank both Expo and Al Sirkal teams, all partners, and most importantly, um, practitioners and thinkers who helped us shape and mold the content of this program for their intellectual labor and commitment. Please join me in expressing our immense gratitude on behalf of Al Sirkal family, our community in acknowledging Her Excellency Reem Al Hashimi for her leadership of Expo 2020. <laughs> and of course, Nadia Verji, her chief of staff, who uh, unfortunately couldn't join us this afternoon, 
uh, and her team, uh, Hindal Bohm, who uh, led it besides her, uh, next to her, uh, this entire program, and as we shaped the content together, for most importantly, for believing and trusting El Circle Advisory to be your partner. Thank you for making Expos our second home for the past year and for trusting a homegrown organization grounded in an international network to um, create this program and realize this program together with you. Before I hand you over to my colleague Nada Raza, who is the director of Al Circle Arts Foundation and who really con uh, conceptually uh, shaped uh, Water Week, um, to introduce uh, and, and open uh, this week, I would like to leave you with an excerpt uh, of Najum Al Ghanem's poem, Commissioned for Space Week, titled I Found My Way to You, translation by Khaled Al Masri. And just before in the green room, I was saying to my colleagues, I don't know what I was thinking by including this excerpt and citing Najum Al Ghanem's poem, because I think many of you who know the artist, uh, she's definitely more eloquent than, than I am, but I will give it my best. You must believe the stories, the ones that make no claim to truth, but cannot bear lies, like those Sharazat told. You must believe the marks made by the tears of the meteors on the silence of the evening, and the ringing sound of water Water's heart, then the reflected blueness of the Southern Cross leans over its skin. You must believe the poets, then they allege that light is like water, like a river, and then they swear that many dreams are hidden there in the sky, like bird nests. Thank you. Thank you, Vilma, and a huge thank you to everybody on the Expo team and also on Alter Carl's team. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today, and also thank you to the audience who is listening. Um, the silencing of water. As the music and song archivist Moshimi Bhomik recently told us, in the music of Bengal and of South Asia, there are many ways, many sounds, that describe the flow of water, from the music of a stream to the rush of the ocean, the sound of rain to the cracking of parched earth. Waters can be loud, but we are not listening. Ab, pani, vellum. Even saying the word in your own language suddenly makes you thirsty. The old city of Karachi, where I'm from, had two gates. Mitadar, the sweet door, and Karadar, the brackish, indicating the direction of the river and of the sea. We may not notice it as much as we should, but both fresh and salt water have oriented our cities and dictated how we live and build and whether we survive, thrive, abandon, or invade. Wars of the past and possibly wars of the future involve access to clean drinking water and to strategic ports. The arc of today's presentations follow the path of water as it was taught to us in geography lessons. Does everyone remember that diagram? From glacial melt to dissolving into the ocean, we were taught that systems and of rainfall and weather meant that this resource could renew itself. Now we know that this is not so, and water itself, the one element that we can't do without, is either polluted or running out. In a way, it's a crisis of a magnitude so vast that we struggle to apprehend the full picture because let's face it, the planet is actually more water than Earth. I've often wondered why we call it Earth because it also reveals a, a terrestrial bias. So today we'll take you on a journey with artists, research scientists, policy advisors, musicians, and a chef. Following the course of water from glacial melt to the morsel of sand in an oyster, asking you to watch, listen, and taste to understand our impact on this watery earth, asking you to think from the perspective of the inhabitants and dependents off the water, 
particularly in our region, the interconnected monsoon world of the Indian Ocean. Throughout, we will move through both time and space with an awareness that previous generations lived with and often at the mercy of the elements, and that we have witnessed human and scientific attempts to tame and tamper, and that without a course correction, what the writer Amitav Ghosh has called a great derangement, our inability as thinkers to help people both imagine and counter man-made crises is leading us towards certain catastrophe. So how can we get the point across imaginatively? We will begin with We Are Opposite Like That, an award-winning film by Himali Singh Soin, followed by a presentation by Dr. Vikram Mathur, who will take us from glacial melt downstream towards the ocean along the Mekong River, and then a presentation by Jean Lassus and Shahana Rajani, which will share their research, which was supported by the Elsa Karl Arts Foundation, into the impact of climate change and state intervention on fisher folk communities of the Indus Delta. From there, we transition to the music of the seas with Dr. Razi al Mulefi, widening our gaze across the uh, Arabian Sea into the Khalij and across the Indian Ocean. Dr. Aaron Lobo, the mean scientist, and mean as fish, not a cruel person in Malayalam, looks at the impact of how we exploit the bounties of the one ocean and how we might return to living with rather than profiting from the ocean as a source of food. We'll finish with a fishy feast, which is prepared by Chef Tomsini at the Brazil Pavilion. Um, and through all our presentations today, there is a recognition that the plunder that began with colonial conquest that came across the seas continues in forms that impact lives and livelihoods. And we can't really leave the rivers and oceans to activists and to policymakers. Critical positions that seek to decolonize knowledge and learn from the fishermen and poets and musicians that know the ways of the water intuitively and intimately can offer us new roots, allowing us to dialogue with, hear, and heed the water before it drowns us out. We will begin with Himali Singh Soin's film, We Are Opposite Like That, winner of the Freeze Artist Award 2019 and co-commissioned by FORMA. The film explores the environment, history and myth, and pairs poetry and archival material to recount the Victorian anxiety of an imminent glacial epoch. The disorienting fear of an invasive periphery sent shudders through the colonial enterprise, the tremors of which can be felt in contemporary times. Inspired by field recordings, an original score for a string quartet creates an etheric soundscape of hissing glaciers and the hard timber of the wind, interspersed with melodic fragments of Edward Elgar's The Snow. We are opposite like that beckons the ghosts hidden in landscapes and turns them into echoes listening in on the resonances of potential futures. Thank you, and we will start the film. A clear inverted mountain floating above the horizon. For historians, the present had lost itself over time. There were no shadows, echoes of no surface. Nobody left to be beautiful. The ghost of what was to come singed.
last frayed edges of what she knew had wilted. Her gelid fingers traced the tapering glaciers marbled with mud. What had survived was ancient. She found fossils of ferns stamped in stones from way back when. Her own landscape had once been opposite like that. The ice moved through her for a few hours a mineral messenger. She felt like a fjord. She'd take kidneys over the North Star and water over watches. She'd take time. She'd take misdirection, indecision, intuition. She'd take suspension over disbelief. She'd take the third person over you. Or the sun and the moon at rest. Not rest like stillness, but the kind of rest in music. A string held taut, an interval with the pedal down. She'd take the confusion, the hysteria of light, the heft of its lurch sideways. The ice fortified her. Fronds of frost stung, spikes spreading like cables pushing signals through. Antony attuned at frazzled frequencies. Beneath her turban, she could hear the grating ring of silence, the screech of crystals forming, futures foreseen, the tangle of tubular seaweed, the rinse of starfish with no harps and double the hunger. The opacity leaked out of her blood and her bones. Spectrum. All the heat had dispersed.
her broken chronometer preserved in ice, still recording two types of error. The imperfection of the image exposed and the great distance it represented. When examined with a telescope, it proved to be our distance from one another. Dead reckoning, adjusting for parallax. Distances were deceptive due to atmospheric clarity and the absence of trees. The gloop of algae, the nets and straws and long distance love letters congealed the ocean into a jungle. Gelatinous gossip. Quartz, astral, petrified. Phosphorescent flares. She went inside the boat, anchored never too close to shore. She was thawing, dripping afterlife. Still, a thin haze persisted. She was translucent. So good evening, everyone. Very excited to be here uh, and very excited uh, to be part of this really interdisciplinary program. I'm a boring scientist. I really get to be part of such, uh, such events. So many thanks to El Sikar Foundation for having me here. Uh, Imali's very evocative film, We Are Opposite Like That, seeks to create fictional myths for two poles from the non-human perspective of a melting fossil that has witnessed the great shifts of the epoch, the ice. I take it from there, I walk, I will talk about the journey of the river from the glaciers that Himali's film invokes to the delta, which is subject to the work of artists Shahana Ranjani and Jean Lassis, and onwards to the oceans and seas that connect us all. These will be explored by Boom Divan and Dr. Aaron Lobo uh, through music and through food, uh, to understand what are these connections uh, that bring us all into this one world. Water is the common thread that links the mountains to the river and the river to the ocean. The ocean in turn connects us all in what we can do in one corner of the earth can have big consequences on the other end. Climate change is striking our rivers and waters first and the hardest. My own research explores the notion of resilience how can we ensure that our social and ecological systems can adapt and cope to changes, retain essential functions and features, and carry on? When I think about rivers, uh, I think about rivers that originate in the Himalayas. There's a great diversity of rivers around the planet, 
but I'm talking about the Himalayan rivers today, the vast waterways of the Mekong, the Ganga, the Indus, and the Brahmaputra that originate in the Himalayas and flow down to the South China Sea, Bay of Bengal, or the Arabian Sea. Lives, livelihoods, and traditions that are touched by the essential and life-giving relationship between civilizations, water, and rivers, cultural connections, and no ways of knowing and ways of understanding are forged through this interaction, shaping our cultural identities and belief systems. But rivers across the world are changing. Uh, rivers are being altered by climatic changes, but also decades of unsustainable development at breakneck speeds. Urbanization, dams, uh, vast agricultural uh, expansion. People and communities struggle to cope with climate impacts and deal with the ecological impacts of large dams, deforestation, coastal erosion, and expanding cities. How, how are we to build resilience, adapt, and learn to live with the changing rivers? My talk today is organized in five short sections. I will take you down the river in four stages. Uh, these stages have been visualized by me, uh, for me by the graphic artist Yuvraj Jha in four panels from the birth of the river in the Himalayas to when it enters the flat plains, passes through a mega city, and meets the sea in the large deltas of our subcontinent. I end by presenting some propositions about how we might think about resilience of our rivers and the, of, the, of the communities and life worlds that depend on them. Resilience of rivers, resilience of people needs to be reimagined in the face of climate change. So the birth of the river. The river is born high up in the Himalayas. I often think of the Mekong that originates in what is known as the Three River Sources area on the Tibetan Plateau in the Eastern Himalayas in the Yunnan province of China. The Mekong River, known as the Lansang in China, is the heart and soul of mainland Southeast Asia. I have worked on the Mekong for over, past, for over 10, 10 years, uh, and, and even my own doctorate research was around the Mekong system. So you will see that I refer to it a lot in my presentation today. Slow-moving rivers of ice, the glaciers of the Himalayas provide water to those in the Indo-Gangetic Plains. The accumulation of snow over thousands of years on this mighty range has led to the formation of these glaciers. The villages of Nepal, India, Tibet, Pakistan, along the glacial mountains are entwined with the flow of the glacier and water which sustain various life worlds. But these worlds are changing. Himalayan glaciers have shrunk 10 times faster in the past four decades than during the previous seven centuries. The Himalayan glaciers are retreating at rates ranging from 10 to 60 meters per year, and many small glaciers, and when I talk about small glaciers, less than 0.2 square kilometers have already disappeared. Both north and, and in recent news, uh, as the Arctic enters its spring, it is 50 degree Fahrenheit warmer than usual, as the Antarctic approaches its autumn, it's 70 degrees warmer than average. Due to climate crisis, the Arctic is already experiencing two to three times faster uh, than global average. Warming is experiencing warming two to three times faster than global average. The impact of shrinking glaciers, melting ice are systemic and complex. With retreating glaciers, glacial lakes are growing in size and number. Lake Imja Tosho in the Everest region was virtually non-existent in the 1960s, but now it covers nearly one square kilometer. A number of, and sorry for the technical words here, glacial lake outburst, outburst flood events have been reported in this region, which has resulted in loss of many lives as well as destruction of houses, fields, forests, and roads. On the one hand, melting glaciers can cause floods, but glaciers, as they disappear in the longer term, uh, will slowly dry up our rivers. Uh, scientists also struggle to trace and understand all the impacts on the ecosystems and communities in the region. In the Mekong and elsewhere, climate change is further complicated by the damming along the rivers. Uh, when I started my work on the Mekong in the early 2000s, a series of 14 cascade dams were being planned in the Mekong. Uh, but the upper Mekong River Basin, now the Lansang in China, has already built 16 of those dams, and 14 more are to be completed in the next five to 10 years. 
In the upland Laos area, 70 dam dams are in operation, and Laos has signed MOUs of for, for 246 other dams, which will severely impact the water flow in the Mekong. So moving on now to the, to, uh, the flood plains, the rivers change as they come down the mountains uh, into the vast flood plains, bringing with them and depositing sediments and creating alluvial plains, which are the food baskets of the world. The Mekong changes as the valley opens out, the flood plain becomes wider and the river meanders and becomes slower. For 70 million people who live in the lower Mekong, the 2,500-mile 2, long river is the source of all life. Everyone depends on it and its tributaries for fish and food. The impacts of climate change here again are complex and, systematic and systemic and often difficult to predict. What we know is that both droughts and floods will increase in frequency and intensity. The impact on of these on ecosystems, both natural and agricultural, come with another set of uncertainties. Fish and rice, which is a staple of the people living in the Mekong region, is likely to be impacted. Rice yields in the Mekong region could fall up, fall up to 15 to 25 percent as heat bills fall down by 15 to 25 percent as the heat, heat bills, triggering a food crisis for millions of people. As a result of the wider temperature changes. Farmers are beginning to notice unusual pets in their fields and changes in the growing pattern of existing crops. But the Mekong is also drying up each year, and the river flows over the last three years being the lowest ever recorded. Sorry, I might have... Yeah, so the Mekong is also drying up each year, uh, and the river flows in the last three years are the lowest ever recorded. The 2020 the, was the lowest on record. A drying Mekong threatens the survival of the world's largest inland fishery with more than 100, more than 1,000 species of fish providing livelihoods and food for more than 70 millions are at risk. In eastern Cambodia, uh, the frequency of flood events is likely to increase from an annual probability of 5% under historic conditions to a 76% prob percent probability under future climate scenarios. In the last three years, up to 60%, 62% of the villages along the Mekong ba Basin have experienced losses and, losses and damages due to floods. As the rivers Mekong, Ganga, Yama, Yamuna, Brahmaputra, Indus enter towns and cities, they are channelized. Rationalist control over nature through infrastructure and technologies is the paradigm within which our rivers and cities have been planned. The hydraulic transition, more so in cities than elsewhere, is premised on the need to separate land and water as two distinct overlapping natural domains, a transition affected by engineering interventions in which rivers get quantified as units of flow and controlled and harnessed with weirs and embankments and waterfront development. Rivers flowing, the, flowing through cities offer opportunities for food, transportation, and water, but they also get tamed into concrete channels and turned into dumping grounds for waste and sewage. People, weather, infrastructure interact in cities as, sh as shapes shifting rivers shrink or flood. Proximity to rivers and coastline increases the exposure of climate-induced climate threats and hazards in many mega cities like Bangkok, Dhaka, Ho Chi Minh City. With the symbiotic relationship between groundwater and rivers disrupted in most places, rivers in these cities are likely to be seasonal, dry up, and lead to drought in the long term. Due to its low ele elevation and proximity, for example, due to its low elevation and proximity to the Mekong River, Phnom Penh is likely to experience, to be highly vulnerable to the effects of climate change particularly heavy monsoon rains, which can create disruptive urban flooding, while changes in precipitation patterns and, patterns and increasing salt water intrusion adversely affect the city's water supply and ecosystem. Very often, it's the informal settlements uh, in these cities, which are in, 
which are in low-lying areas, which are most vulnerable uh, to urban and, and ba lack basic infrastructure and access to services. Almost 70% of potential slum areas will be exposed to floods in Ho Chi Minh City in the next 10 years. Eventually, all things merge into one and the river runs through it. The river meets the sea in the mighty deltas of South and Southeast Asia. Unique worlds are created in the deltas like the Sundarbans in the India and Bangladesh. Uh, as the Mekong, uh, Runs, uh, touches the South China Sea, it divides into nine mouths in Vietnam. And the vast low-lying delta of the Mekong is home to 20 million people, uh, a network of canals and waterways, dikes, paddy fields, narrow roads in small villages. The Mekong Delta in Vietnam is farmed intensively and has little natural vegetation left. Complex changes, on the one hand, sea level rise is likely to submerge the low-lying areas and deltas, both, but both the reduced water flows and rising sea levels could also increase salinity and lead to saltwater intrusion. The damming of rivers upstream could reduce the sediment load of rivers, destroying coastal marine and mangrove ecosystems. Saltwater intrusion adversely impacts communities work, working in resource-dependent livelihoods like fishing and agriculture, uh, the Red River in Vietnam, for example, has experienced a 76% reduction in annual coastal sediment yield over the last 30 to 40 year period, causing a sediment deficit in the downstream coastal mangroves. Local sea level rise as much as one inch, uh, 25 millimeters per year, has been recorded in parts of the Ganga, Brahmaputra Delta and the Bay of Bengal. This will affect more than 3 million people by 2050. 38% of the Mekong Delta will be submerged underwater if the sea level water rises by one meter. The deltas in Asia collectively contribute to 75% of the world's sediment discharge into the ocean. However, the existing hydropower jams in China, two in Laos, and at least 30, 300 on tributary waterways upstream in the Mekong Basin are retaining most of the sediment in the Mekong River, causing saltwater intrusion of almost 100 kilometers inward. The final stage, the final part of my presentation, I want to talk a little bit about this idea of resilience, uh, resilience resilient rivers, resilient communities. Uh, I would like to, exp I will explore four ideas uh, here. One is about buffering spaces, uh, diversity, preparedness, and amphibious landscapes. Uh, resilience is a really, really complex uh, idea. It started in the field of systems ecology, uh, and at least when I started working with it 20 years ago, I was extremely critical of the framework. But increasingly, uh, I think we are thinking about what resilience means uh, in rivers, and, and uh, yeah, so worth thinking about it. Uh, and there are four ideas that I want to present to you today. Uh, and by, this is by no means a comprehensive uh, view of what resilient rivers would look like, but four ideas of buffering spaces, diversity, preparedness, and amphibious landscapes. Buffer spaces of a river include its catchment, basin, floodplain to form a water course. Uh, for those of you who have been in South Asian cities, you see that the river is often channelized in a very narrow stream, uh, but I talk about the idea of freedom space for rivers as a way to enhance resilience as it protects communities during shocks and extreme events. But the idea of freedom space is that the river needs to be given space to, and to be seen as a dynamic system. Much of the command and control strategies aimed at channel stability, hydraulic efficiency, or flood management need to give way to strategies that allow river spaces to have dynamic boundaries and flood plains. And this is going to be a central uh, issue as we learn to deal with and adapt to climate change in our river systems. Diversity and diversity of strategies, uh, even when we talk about uh, communities uh, and communities that are vulnerable to climate impacts, we talk about diversification of livelihood strategies. But a diversity of strategies, hedging our bets, uh, 
uh, and diversification is a common theme across the resilience literature, uh, building the physical, social, and biological diversity of river systems and their surroundings is imperative for building resilience. The health of these varied but interlinked systems allow for a range of reactions for the management of extreme, ev extreme events. To build local resilience, riverine communities need to be prepared for extreme events, but also the slow onset changes of climate change. Preparedness must be developed through participatory, culturally appropriate, and inclusive methods to, to ensure efficiency. In certain situations, adaptation to climate change will not be possible, and entirely new lives and livelihoods will need to be imagined. Uh, I was recently critical of uh, a resilience project in Thailand, which was, in some sense, moving the communities that have lived across, along the Chao Phraya River outside the riverbed as a way to promote their resilience. Uh, and that's what I mean by culturally appropriate. Uh, there will be instances where people will need to relocate uh, and move up to higher ground, but there are also ways of, of thinking about resilience, uh, which is much more embedded to their current, current context. Uh, my doctoral research, uh, which happened uh, almost a decade ago, was around a very, very interesting lake system in the Mekong River system, uh, which is called the Tonlisap Lake. Uh, the communities living around the lake have developed unique ways of living with floods over hundreds of years. Their homes are raised high above on sills, uh, and when the flood comes, the homes begin to float, they tie them up to boats, and they move around on the lake. Architects are also beginning to reimagine what such spaces would look like elsewhere in the world. But I don't want to romanticize the idea of floating homes and amphibious cities. Uh, there, is, there are islands within the delta in Bangladesh, for example, where uh, vast patches of land are disappearing every day, and these communities are likely to face permanent loss and damage, uh, and we need to think about how are we going to deal with such permanent loss and damage? Even in the global negotiations for those who follow uh, the COP26, uh, where many of us were excited about a Santiago framework on loss and damage, uh, were deeply disappointed uh, because our host, the UK, didn't do a really good job at that negotiation. And we are hoping that we'll be now uh, have better luck in Sharm el Sheikh in COP27. Uh, <clears throat> So yeah, just to conclude, and in some sense as a segue to the next uh, presentation, uh, which is very, very colorful, I, I really enjoyed it, and I think so will you. Uh, I do want to point out that it's difficult to undo years and years of engineering. The introduction of hydrological infrastructure over the years, in essence, was a way to provide legal claim over land, and the river flow was recast as a resource. <clears throat> this will need to be undone in the coming years. Uh, Shahana Rajani and Jean, Agent Jean Lass Lassis are artists based in Karachi and Bangkok, respectively. Their project, which you will see next, traces practices and transmissions of situated knowledges in the Indus Delta to develop sensorial methods that grapple with climate change, ecological disturbances, and the politics of representation. They focus on coast coastal communities reckoning with infrastructural development. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I think that's, that I'm really looking forward to that, that particular uh, film that is going to be, uh, you know, is, is the next thing on the agenda. And I think it links back to, as a scientist, of course, this is going to create uh, challenges for me, but I think, uh, yeah, it links back to how we learn to know our systems. And I think what, what, what these conversations and, and the participation of of, of people from different disciplines in these conversations is that we have need multiple ways of knowing and understanding, and very often science has not really led to uh, effective ways to manage our river systems. Uh, so de definitely really keen to see what, what comes next. Thank you very much. I hope that was not too many numbers, but... <laughs> Thank you so much, Vikram. And I've known you for many years, but this is the first time I'm actually um, hearing about your work, and, and it's, uh, it's a real pleasure and privilege. 
Um, we'll open up to questions from the floor. Um, so if you have a question, please raise your hand and I think a mic will appear. Um, I see a question in the, here, here. The, Hello. the third from last row in the middle. Hello. Hi. Hi. I wonder whether the stupas, the, if you've explored that in the Himalayas, the work of freezing water before it melts and overflows in the basin. Um, I'm so, you, you, you mean the, the, the Buddhist stupas? Um, I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm familiar with the practice, uh, but, but I think uh, the scale uh, that we are talking about uh, in terms of uh, the kind of environmental impact, I mean, I think there's a real cultural value in understanding those systems, but, but you know, I mean, I think, think very often, you know, there is this whole idea of, of sacred rivers and sacred ecology, uh, especially in India, but I'm, I'm somewhat a cynic uh, to some of those discourses because in the face of kind of technology and, 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 uh, and power and, and money, uh, it's really difficult to see how some of those really beautiful practices can have real impact. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, I mean, so I mean, I, ha I have been in those, those areas uh, in the uplands and the extreme Himalayan areas. Uh, and you know, even Lansang, there's some beautiful monasteries and so on and so forth. But, you know, when you're faced with a string of 14 cascade dams, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how do you kind of balance that out. And I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, and I'm, I mean just, just to give you some context of my own work, I, I started as a, as a natural scientist, but my doctorate research is actually anthropology. But yeah, I mean, sacred ecology sac and, and some of those practices are difficult to sustain, I think. Uh, I don't know if that's too cynical <laughs> response. But. But yeah, we should document those, we should understand. Uh, but yeah. It's interesting, Vikram, because I think you know, part of the, the program here for People and Planet is really to think about those practices. And I understand that this may not be scalable, but uh, we were talking earlier about dams and the fact that the people who are protesting against them have a case, but they don't stand a chance, right? Um, but is there something that you have come across in your research where there has been some kind of exemplary uh, practice maybe between communities and the state or, or big power that has actually had impact? I mean, I think the social, the, 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 there's a, I mean, obviously, India has a strong, I mean, I'm speaking now from India and not so much from the Mekong. Uh, definitely, when it comes to Southeast Asia, uh, till even the late 1990s, till almost 2000, uh, because of the war uh, and, and the security situation, actually Laos, Cambodia, and large parts of Vietnam were totally unexploited. Uh, and, and the Mekong was actually the last frontier. Uh, but I'm sorry to say, in relation to dams, uh, certainly in the Mekong, that battle was lost, right? Uh, and <laughs> I wish I could say something more positive, but, but that's, that's really the case. And, and, and yeah, and a lot of activists really suffered. I had friends uh, who, were very, who were very active in that upper uh, basin in China, and many of them moved to Canada and had to relocate. So I think the Mekong, at least that kind of uh, social movements against the, against the river have not worked. In India, there are some successes. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly, you know, in, in, in the Narmada Andolan, and there were many kind of high profile anti-dam movements. Uh, and, and there is, yeah, there is some kind of, uh, some impact of that and better, but better relocation uh, possibilities and so on and so forth. But I think, you know, very few countries, only Bhutan I know in, this, in that area, which has actually said no to large scale dams, but otherwise, I, <laughs> sorry, there are none you see that I can, question. I can think of. Please uh, ask something that will give us some hope. There should be some hope. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I'm trying, let, me, let, me, let me have another crack at this one. Uh, and definitely, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, Aaron and I have been working on, who you will hear from later, have been working on the rejuvenation of a very small creek in the city of 
of Panjim uh, in, uh, in, in, in Goa and, and, and yeah, and there are, there are around these smaller systems, especially when, but they're also, you know, you're competing with real estate and you're competing with demand for riverfront housing, <laughs> housing societies and Riverview condominiums. Uh, but yeah, there are some really interesting ways uh, in which, uh, you know, native species are being reintroduced for bank management and, and, uh, and, and for improving water quality. Uh, so, you know, science is making some progress on those, but I think it's, it's yeah, it's really difficult to compete with, with the big interests uh, on the land. So a question from the audience? Yeah, uh, I, my question is positive. I wanted to ask, um, what are some technologies, whether recent or ancient, that you believe could be sustainable, could be feasible for this kind of amphibian living um, what, if you could solve the problem and had all of the resources to create a solution, what might you come up with? For me, I mean, for me, uh, very, the idea that I'm most uh, wedded to in the context of rivers uh, is this idea of freedom space, that in some sense, land use planning has to change. Uh, and I think if we, I do believe that if we, and this has happened now in certain, you know, you see with the Danube and some good examples in Europe, where you actually think about the floodplain and you provide that space for the river uh, to, to rejuvenate. Uh, you know, oh, constructed banks have been broken. I was looking at a really exciting project uh, in Aarhus uh, in Denmark, you know, where they, they, they brought a river back to life uh, by uh, de-channelizing it, by moving uh, buildings and infrastructure uh, out of the way uh, and giving the river the space to rejuvenate, right? So, and I think that, that, that really works. It's difficult to imagine sometimes in those really busy and, and heavily populated cities of South Asia, but, uh, but yeah, I think better ways of planning our land use and better ways of planning our cities uh, could definitely be one way to think about creating the basis for the river to, to be resilient and to, to rejuvenate. Thank you. I think we've got to free ourselves from the land. And we talk about the doom and gloom of, of, of habitat loss. But I think, uh, as Nardis said at the beginning, we come from the sea. We are a planet that is two-thirds water. And I think rather than dwelling on all that we're losing, I think we should be concentrating on all that we can make and how we need to adapt to a situation that we know is inevitable. Yes, climate change and all the things that uh, uh, were discussed in Glasgow will help, but I think we've got to think about the future and not just bemoan what, we've, what we're losing. And, and I think in terms of architecture and design and development, there are huge opportunities to create communities, to create living cities on the sea and off, off the land and let the land recover rather than try to bemoan its loss. And by recovering, then we can recover the planet. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, no, I think definitely uh, we, should, we should have that. I mean, I think there are some interesting, uh, interesting ideas about uh, adaptable cities and flexible cities and cities that are much more amphibious uh, in nature and housing on rivers uh, or even housing on coastal areas. Uh, and traditionally, at least, as I was mentioning, the communities that I work with uh, in, in Cambodia have, have deployed some of those strategies and lifestyles. So yeah, it would be interesting to see how those can be scaled up, what kind of costs uh, will they come at, which, which communities and which countries will be able to afford it uh, would also yeah. be something that I would like to think more about. Uh, but yeah, certainly we need to think about ways in which uh, we can adapt. We were talking about Marina Tabassum's project that was shown here at the Sharjah Architecture Triennial, which was sort of flat pack housing based on traditional housing methods, um, but which were meant for the communities uh, along the delta. But I think you're right, Vikram. I think there is a sort of um, reality check there as well, because of course it's not as if we've left the, the water unpolluted. And as, as Aaron will later show us, there's all these changes happening within the ocean, which is not visible to us always, but the moment you start seeing what's actually going on there, it's, it's quite sobering. 
Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, just just as a parting point, I was I was in Shamnagar after uh, like a year after the the, cat, the Hurricane Isla mm -hmm. struck in Bangladesh, and I mean, I'm always amazed at how strong those communities are, but I'm not going to wish them uh, disaster housing for the rest of their lives. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and as 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 charming as some of those ideas could be. Uh, and I certainly think that, uh, yeah, I mean, migration uh, and, and planned retreat uh, and some of those ideas need to be explored uh, mm -hmm. at, the, at the international level. Uh, and, uh, you know, where are the Delta is heavily, heavily populated, uh, if, we, if, we, we, if we plan retreat from those low-lying low deltas, where are those communities going to go? Are you going to put them in? in big camps with... Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, so, yeah, so I mean, yeah, we have, to, we, have to, we have to think about these questions quite hard. I'm really sorry if I'm sounding <laughs> gloomy, but, uh, but unfortunately, that's how I sometimes feel. So. We have time for one more question. We have one. Hi, uh, so I come from Rajasthan, uh, which is one of the most beautiful uh, states of India. And what I learned from this particular uh, place is the celebration for water. And some of the most beautiful and incredible water structures are from the Western India. So my question is like, um, how do we reconnect to water from the social and cultural perspective that you just spoke? Because a lot of times, especially now, water is not a resource. It's more of a commodity that we have right now. And uh, the kind of uh, livelihood that might develop from water is also extremely uh, a linear perspective of what we see. So um, what, what is your take on to make people aware or to educate about these uh, connection that we have to water, basically to reconnect to water as a resource and not as a commodity? Yeah, no, I think. Uh... Uh, yeah, if I was talking about drylands, I would have a positive story. Uh, and certainly, <laughs> I think uh, rainwater harvesting is something I practice uh, and is certainly something that is uh, traditionally been done in Rajasthan and done very well. Uh, so there are a lot of, lot of documentation of the step wells and of the bowries uh, and rainwater collection systems that you are referring to. And there are a lot of really positive projects for rejuvenation of those systems uh, and even modern day rainwater harvesting techniques have really, really uh, addressed the situation in the context of dryland areas, right? If it rains, you can collect it. Uh, and, and, and definitely that's a, uh, that's a technology that is uh, worth talking about. And it's a traditional technology which is finding resonance in the contemporary world. Uh, and, and I think, I think programs like this, uh, I think uh, are, is, is what you need. I mean, as a scientist, you know, once I, I said this, you know, I want to go on a strike. Nobody really listens to me. I think more science is just, you know, it's like a surfeit of science. There's this smorgasbord of science, and we keep producing more and more science every day. Uh, and the physical science basis, for example, for climate change, has been known for the past 20 years, right? Uh, it's more contrary, you know, if you're following the global process, uh, there are people saying, let's stop doing working group one of the IPCC, largely because that's all the scientists making projections saying, oh, it's going to increase by 3%, 2%, 4%, 1.2%. Uh, but I think the levers of change are much more social in nature, right? Uh, and, and, uh, and science is not really driving. So I'm not saying that we should teach people uh, more science to reconnect. So we should, but, but definitely, I think uh, some kind of cultural engagement uh, is really the way to go. Uh, but, but and there are interesting ways uh, that people are pursuing it. Uh, but when does it become a movement? Um, you know, when does that kind of awareness uh, become a movement and lead to behavioral change? Uh, yeah, those are, those are the interesting frontiers of knowledge. Uh, I'm beginning to work now increasingly on behavioral change. I'm not that interested anymore in the sort of data that I was presenting to you today, uh, largely because that data has been there for long time, but how do, we, how do we convince people that they need to mm -hmm. change the way they live and the way they consume is really what we have to think about. And maybe Nada knows 
<laughs> that yes. more than the eye <laughs> But together, yeah, think, Vikram, together, these, solidarity. I think these sorts of conversations between yeah. science and art is something yeah. I'm really deeply interested in uh, yeah. uh, at the moment. Uh, and I think maybe let's say that's one way to connect. Mm -hmm. You know, young people is the other hope. Uh, uh, there are now in very interesting social movements I see within India where young people are getting together and doing things and they're forming various sorts of communities, and that, that gives me hope. You know, I'm interested in those processes and those movements uh, and to see how we can support them. Thank but no you. more science. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, we go to uh, Jean and Shahana's presentation. Jean is based actually in Thailand, so this, this connects the Mekong to the Indus, uh, which is where Shahana Rajani is based in Karachi. So we'll watch Wonderful. the film next. Thank Thanks you. very much. <laughs> This presentation emerges from our ongoing research uh, project called Embodied Cartographies and Visual Entanglements in the Indus Delta. Uh, it's a project that is supported by the Al-Sakar Arts Foundation Research Grant. Shahana and I today will be focusing on two intertwining threads. Uh, the first tracing the relationship between colonial vision, map making and deltaic landscapes. And the second looking at what we call embodied cartographies, which are situated knowledges and practices of fisher folk communities, communities who understand land and water, not as a binary, but through degrees of wetness. Learn from the fisher folk who have generously shared their knowledge and experience with us. Working the, in the Delta has really forced us to reckon with the hard edges of the coasts we live on today. As Anuradha Mathur and Dilip de Kuna writes, these coasts are the historical product of a determined effort to imagine lines where none exist. The maps of the Sindh archive are full of correction lines that attempt to trace the changing course of the Indus River, its channels and creeks, and the edges of the delta that were constantly morphing into new contours as the river made contact with the sea. Year upon year, new boundaries were laid down by colonial officials as this fertile land was fixed and propertied. But each time the surveyors returned, they always found that the delta had shifted, evading and defying their previous lines. They repeated their measuring exercises and set out to making new maps. These shifting lines haunt the certainty and fixity of the map. They tease and taunt, unraveling the hard cartographic line that separates land and water. In the delta, land masses flow and move in sync with the flows of the river, with the rhythms of the sea and the cycles of the moon. In the soaking ecology, the logic of the map breaks down. What does it mean to map a shifting landscape? anchoring permanent forms to impermanent things. While our urban conception of land emerges from attempts to control the flow of water to create the solid grounds of urban planning, in the Delta, we are repeatedly told that the river has the highest claim on land. Land and water are understood as inseparable and intertwined and fertile silt known as Vari in Sindhi, their intermediary. The earliest colonial map of the Indus Delta was made by Alexander Burns during his spy mission of 1831. While docked at Hyderabad, Burns made several voyages to the mouths of the Indus creeks. 
In his memoir, he talks at length about the unpredictable banks which made navigation in its foul and muddy waters both dangerous and difficult. In places, he writes, the water is cast with such impetuosity from one bank to another that the soil is constantly falling in upon the river in huge masses of clay hourly tumble into the stream, often with a tremendous crash. It is clear from his descriptions that land is constantly being made and remade by water flows. Yet he claims with great pride and conviction, a map of the mouths of the river now lay before me. Seven years later, colonial officials were sent to Karachi in 1838 to survey and map its coast in preparation for conquest. What the British found was not a hard coastline, but an undulating landscape that shifted with tidal flows and rhythms, varying degrees of wetness everywhere. Mud, sand and rocks, sand, sand, rock, sand, sandy islet, low sandy hillocks overrun with creepers, Swamps overflowed at high water. Mangrove bushes. Dry land at low water spring tides. Sand, mud, clay. Riverbed of Liari stream. Hard clay and sand. The map drawn from Thomas Greer Carlos's surveys of 1838 registers the diversity of textures and temporal land water formations. In its first encounter with the colonial gaze, this landscape refused the flatness of the map, demanding to be reckoned with on its own terms. While cartographers struggled to render the temporality of the deltaic ecology into the static frames of their maps, instead of seeing the limits to their representational frames, they worked in fixing the landscape. The colonial ports of Karachi, Bombay, and Calcutta are all products of imposing the logic of the map on fluid landscapes. Colonial processes of draining, drying, and reclaiming conjured stable land from watery terrains in an effort to create the solid grounds of urban planning. These technologies of fixing, as historian Devjani Bhattacharya calls it, have enforced a collective amnesia about these cities' wet and soaking ecologies. The Indus River, once described as a mighty, sacred, and untamable river, has through imperial regimes of water been disfigured, segmented, and distributed into the largest irrigation system of the world. Since the construction of Kotri Baraj in 1954, 70% of the Delta's inhabitants have been forced to leave as the Indus River no longer reaches the Delta and the sea is fast eroding their lands. It is estimated that only 10% of the active Delta remains according to a 2008 report. Many of the displaced have found their way to the coastal settlements of Karachi in Ibrahim Hedri and Riri Goat. A sinking, disappearing delta offset by the ever expanding coastline of Karachi. All Sindhi fisher folk we meet remind us of Karachi's place within the Indus Delta. There's a practice of narrating the 17 creeks, beginning with Kurangi Creek in Karachi. Some fisher folk also include the four creeks that are now in India. Number one, the Peli Creek is Kurangi Creek. Kurangi Creek. Dusi, number two, Fiti Creek. Fiti Creek. Number three, Kudi Creek. Kudi Creek. Number four, Khai Creek. Creek. Number uh, uh, five, uh, Paitiani Creek. Paitiani. Paitiani Creek. 
तपोक्रिक तपो तपोक्रिक छान क्रिक छान क्रिक अजामरो क्रिक अजामरो क्रिक तुरछान क्रिक तुरछान क्रिक खोबर क्रिक खोबर क्रिक गोरो क्रिक गोरो क्रिक सनडी क्रिक सनडी कायर क्रीक कायर क्रीक मल क्रीक मल क्रीक वारी क्रीक वारी क्रीक काजर क्रीक काजर और सत्रु यहां जिसकी एक क्रीक कर कर सत्रु हो गया a string of creeks a name for all the mouths the narration and repetition of these names evoke a sense of connection between these creeks and coastal areas it is an orality and a way of understanding the creeks that doesn't necessitate fixing a knowing that emerges from repeated acts of living and traveling within the delta the list becomes a succession a thread a form of transmission elders also narrate poems that were used as sensorial tools for navigation songs about stars as orientation devices poems that enabled fisher folk to attune to hidden rhythms of the environment these aquatic imaginaries and poetic registers are centered around alternate forms of relationality a different kind of knowing emerges in and through these songs enlivening the delta as a space for sensing feeling touching and imagining at sea There's a wave that always goes towards the coast called the Osam. Fisher folk rely on it to navigate. It is a wave within the waves that does not follow the push of the wind but follow the pull of the land. Fisher folk can see it but also sense it through how it moves their bodies and boats. When they set sail from Ibrahim Hedri to the eastern creeks, they feel the successive twists and turns of the coast. studio sam they navigate with the continuous echo of the coastline navigation depends on a tactile memory of the coast and sea in many ways fisher folk extend their sensing bodies far beyond their bodily envelope the tactile knowledge of the coast extends underwater as fisher folk also use the depth of the seabed to determine where they are chacha ibo A poet and fisherman from Rary Goat tells us how people used to be able to know which creek they were in by dropping a stone with a rope to the seabed and looking at the texture, color, and taste of the mud. The language of soil and water is one of tactility, texture, wetness, and taste. People from Ibrahim Ibrahim Hidri and Rary Goat use the word darya meaning river when re referring to the nearby sea. Fatma Majid, vice chairperson of the Pakistan Fisher Folk Forum, explains to us that when the river used to flow, it used to extend far beyond the coast, pushing back the sea. People living in the creeks were living by the river, not the sea. And while the sea surrounds us now, she says we still call those waters darya remembering where the river used to be as the sea advances homes villages towns farmlands entire islands have been submerged under the sea water yet people retain a knowledge a memory of what was lost of where the coast used to be when fisher folk go 12 kilometers into the sea from hajamro creek they sense unusual ridges barriers and protrusions on the seabed some believe that the former city of keti bandar lies here a port town that has had to relocate three times in the past century alone 14 kilometers into sea fisher folk sometimes see the saint haji pir mohammed standing on the water above where his grave once used to be In the delta all the creeks and islands have their own shrines these saints were known to protect the coast holding the sea at bay but now some of their graves have been swallowed by the sea and their shrines have been had to relocate several times no longer holding the material graves within their walls 
Yet, as the saints continue to appear in the water, they mark and remind passers-by of a sacred geography, practices of remembrance and placemaking in the shadow of loss. We encounter a ghost geography of the sea, sensings of tension and disturbance in the face of ongoing violence and erasure. We understand these practices and knowledges as embodied cartography, which rely on being part of a place, rely on the acknowledgement of the web of interconnectivity between human beings, animals, spirits, and elements. Navigation and fishing here is not a cold, scientific, extractive practice, but are linked to the senses, nature, ritual, dreams, prayers, and visions. At a moment when plans are underway to transform Hajamro Creek into a deep seaport, the Delta makes visible the fallacy of viewing land as inert background and the high cost of infrastructural projects that are drying and reclaiming land, ravaging and destroying the many interdependent worlds sustained by the Delta. It reminds us that our hard bordered and concrete cities were once too moving and watery spaces that were alive and breathing. Ours is an attempt to develop a way of reading space that moves beyond the one-dimensional cartographic register to account for the different cosmologies, temporalities, and place-making practices in the face of erasure. A way to expand beyond our urban-centered conceptions and approaches. Sadly, uh, John and Shahana can't be with us because they're in the Indus Delta attending a whale festival. Um, but as they mentioned, it's a project that we have been supporting and we are hoping to bring them here later in the year. So you will see them in Dubai in the future. But it's a great place to begin the conversation with you, Razi, and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having um, me. I'm going to read a little something by way of introduction and then open up to some questions and then we'll hear um, your latest release. So Ghazi Faisal al mulefis journey began with one statement from his grandfather who was once a Kuwaiti pearl diving shipmaster. All the men died at sea. Now an ethnomusicologist at NYU Abu Dhabi, Ghazi has spent his career researching Kuwaiti pearl diving music and the lives of the pearl divers in order to connect with his ancestral past. In the process, his work has uncovered long lost narratives that have larger implications on how we think about cultural appropriation, tradition, and national identity. When Kuwait became a nation in 1961, the music of pearl diving became codified as a national signifier for the country. The music was no longer allowed to morph and change as it had for hundreds of years prior when the pearl divers were out at sea traveling along their trading routes. Razi realized that his ancestors were global citizens in their own right, and without these current ideals about fixed heritage and national identity, they experienced a freedom of cultural sharing that we no longer have today. From this revelation, Boom Divan, Razi's collaborative global jazz ensemble was created. Inspired by Kuwaiti pearl diving music of the Indian Ocean trade, with influences all the way from Zanzibar to Calicut, Boom Divan emphasizes fluidity and cross-cultural conversations through their music. Today, their work is a fusion of Latin, jazz, and Middle Eastern influence. Um, and as, as I think we were hearing in the presentation, there is a kind of sensing body, which is you, that has sort of um, found this methodology of working. Um, but I'd like you to say a little bit about how you see your work in relation to the discipline of ethnomusicology and this attempt to fix tradition. And your methodology as a musician 
wanting to move beyond appropriation and fixity and, and how you have really arrived at this collaborative method. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, this is a really, this is a really big topic that I'm, I'm still trying to uh, figure out, to be honest with you. The power of ethnography is that we rely on people's stories and give people um, the chance, the voice to express um, their histories without the, um, the need to be thinking about uh, representations of you know, national heritage uh, and so on and so forth. So um, I think before I started thinking about learning about Kuwaiti pearl diving music, which, is, which adds a term in, in actually writing some, some wrongs, as it were, is a term that's never used in Arabic. We never say pearl diving music. We say the sea arts. So that's something I'd like to change maybe today, the sea arts. Um, is, uh, no, I mean, and it's, it's a term that's used, you know, widely everywhere, but it's, it's just wrong. Um, and I've been guilty of using it too, so I'm sorry. Um, is is where, does, where do these traditions exist residually? And I found this on an annual pearl diving trip in Kuwait that was sponsored by the government. Um, and of course, I was very interested to see how these traditions were being represented as heritage and, and to think about playing the you know, music of the, the sea arts I'd maybe have to inhabit a space corporeally, and so to learn how to pearl dive myself. And there was a gentleman, uh, the late uh, Nohada Khalifa Rashid, who was one of the last uh, pearl divers uh, who took it upon himself to teach about 100 students every year in Kuwait. Um, and his mission was very personal outside of the, the range of heritage national discourse. In fact, he was uh, very critical of what was happening on, the, on this expedition. And from him, uh, we became very good friends uh, until he passed away. From him, I learned how to pearl dive and kind of had this access to his stories and his history um, about what, this, what these sea arts meant and what the connection to the sea meant in a very you know, corporeal way that exists outside of the realm of any classroom or book. So to inhabit the space kind of physically and spiritually was very, very important to me as, a, as an entryway to being somebody who's still trying to discover what this music really is. And the fact that this music defies, um, as we were speaking earlier, this, this notion of origin, mm -hmm. of a center, is its strength. You know, the, if I think about people like my, my grandfather, who uh, my family were among the last three still practicing pearl diving in Kuwait, um, and uh, they were also shipmasters. You know, he, for him and the people of his, um, you know, the people of, on his ship, let's just say, they weren't thinking about culture or heritage or society or art. They were surviving. And they were surviving in this body of water. And what made this survival possible was this kind of music making that was very spiritual in nature, that by its very nature necessitated a certain kind of openness, and this kind of openness to being permeated and to permeate in return. So this, this kind of give and take that was very much guided by nature, right? The monsoon, the monsoons, and so on. And so as I think about uh, engaging with this music today, it's very important for me as you said earlier, to write the tradition, to write the tradition is to let the music go where it needs to go and to get out of the way and to find people to dialogue that music with. And on one end, I'm very anchored with traditional Kuwaiti pearl diving. Sorry, <laughs> I said it again. <laughs> Bahari, Bahari. Sea arts, we'll just stay, stay with Bahari. <laughs> uh, ensembles to kind of ground where I'm going, but then have the, have their permission to kind of explore and put the music back in its rightful place. And the music uh, is not just a traditional form, but an archive, right? It kind of tells of the experience of fear and belief and prayer. Uh, Minaret starts with a prayer. But they're also a way of motivating, right? It's a way of kind of, in very difficult circumstances, keeping the, the crew going. But could you say a little bit about this, uh, about your research around 
Bari music and the kind of range and lack of homogeneity in the Gulf? Because we think of pearl diving music as, as one form, but actually your research has shown that it's incredibly diverse even within that form. Right, so I mean, even, even you know, so let's say the most, uh, the, the highest ranking member of a ship is a shipmaster, and we call him a nochada. That term in and of itself is, uh, is, a, is a term of uh, Persian, mm -hmm. Persian origins. Uh, the same with the naham. The naham is the, uh, the singer on a, um, on, um, on a seafaring ship, and the third highest paid member of the, of the crew, and the good nahams were sought out to keep the spirits of the uh, sailors up, uh, no doubt, but um, they were also the very uh, instructing voices of what was going to happen next. So if, a, if it was time to raise a sail, the Naham would say, Idrab salli, which really literally translated as hit and pray, but all the crew knows that means raise the sail. Um, and so it's very interesting that the, the Nukhida would tell the Naham, it's time to raise the sail. The Naham says, Idrab salli. Uh, it's a very indirect way to give a command. Mm -hmm. All right, so there's that aspect of it. The second part of it is like, as soon as he says that, he's going to start with a poem. Depending on what's happening on the ship, um, that poem is supposed to be the right poem at the right time to make the right kind of work possible. And so what I mean by this is, um, the Naham had to have a really, uh, had to have a, a really kind of an incredible sensitivity to be able to absorb the pain and the suffering of the, uh, the sailors and uh, the pearl divers and to sing it back to them and to sing it back to them with honesty. And so mm -hmm. honesty plays a very big role in his capability to transmit their pain back to them. And so this feedback loop of pain and uh, singing these lamentations and it's all like dhikr, like it's very, very, you know, very, uh, um, similar to uh, Sufi uh, dhikr, you know, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Allah, like, so the, all these like trans, uh, trans inducing, uh, I mean, of course, this is a very, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a very accepted way to think about it, but it, it is exactly how it functions as a spiritual kind of trance. So, so uh, yes, the, it was about keeping the spirits up, but there was something a lot deeper than that. It's about kind of making a certain kind of work possible through a certain kind of spiritual uh, expression that really needed the Snaham to, um, to, to have a really kind of an extreme acute sensitivity and empathy to what was happening. So um, a lot of these rhythms, of course, were, were, um, were the result of these engagements between, let's say, the coastal, the Swahili coast, Zanzibar, and the, and the mm -hmm. coast of India down to Ceylon. Um, and, uh, but they can't exactly be located. Right. which is the beauty of it. Like the moving spirits from the Indus Delta that we just saw. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what we're going to hear next about minarets and, and how this kind of call and response logic of Bari music is a part of it, but also how, um, and maybe say a bit about the visuals that we're going to see um, and how the video um, was made. Because this was a collaboration that happened during the time of COVID. <laughs> That's right. Um, so, so this this collaboration, uh, you know, I'll give thanks to, to Bill Bragan, who's in the crowd here. Uh, the Art Center at uh, New York University Abu Dhabi uh, commissioned Boom Diwan to uh, to participate in their Barzakh festival uh, at the height of the pandemic, and um, I was brainstorming with Bill about what where Boom Diwan should go to go next. Um, and, and maybe before answer that, like boom, boom, Diwan, like what, is, what does that even mean? So the boom is the most important uh, sailing Dao in uh, Kuwaiti culture, Kuwaiti seafaring culture, and is a metaphor for exploration. And the Diwan is what they call the Melis here, the Mejlis. It's the, it's the place where you welcome people and have conversations. So that's, that's where the meaning of, the, uh, of the, uh, the ensemble comes from. So I was thinking about in this, in this you know, at the height of the pandemic and this moment of extreme disconnection and separation, where can we uh, find, what kinds of dialogues are, are necessary right now? And so Bill and I were talking, talking about this and we, he suggested that I reach out to Nduduzo Makatini, who's a South African uh, piano player, uh, the first blue note artist uh, of South Africa, very much steeped in his own KwaZulu traditions, which also take 
the water as a sacred space and um, a source of healing and divination mm -hmm. and so on. And so what, what global jazz does is create this kind of nexus point where we can have these kinds of dialogues. And so uh, Diduz and I had these discussions and decided that it, it would be, it made sense to collaborate. So we opened the, so the minarets is a three movement uh, suite. So minarets are lighthouses in, in Arabic, uh, minara but also uh, the, the names of the, uh, where the call of prayer comes from in the mosque, you know, the, the tower is a minaret, a minaret as well. And so it became kind of this metaphor of this lighthouse to create this kind of sense of direction, hope, and so on. Um, and so we open it with, um, with a, uh, a piece that we co-wrote co -wrote called The Pearl. And The Pearl is basically, um, starts off with a, traditional Kuwaiti seafaring uh, sea arts song called Dawari, which means uh, that which is circular. And the opening lyrics are Bayt al-Rasul Makkah Yamdina, the house of the prophet is in Mecca, and he's, the prophets, they're speaking to the people of, in Medina. And the idea is that, uh, you know, Muslims face you know, Mecca to pray, uh, there's a physical orientation, but there's a spiritual orientation that's also kind of necessary to uh, to pray and to also approach this music making. So it's kind of this opening moment of uh, um, so a really good way to explain it is when pearl divers are trying to open up oysters and find their pearls and they're getting frustrated, the shipmaster will say, clear your intentions and you'll find the pearl. So this opening suite is all about that. It's about finding this orientation to um, to creating a certain kind of music. So mm -hmm. I had many conversations with Ndiduzo, and, uh, and these conversations led to this music, and it was recorded in Kuwait, uh, South Africa, and at the Art Center in Abu Dhabi. Um, and it was, uh, it was a huge act of trust. And it, so the middle piece is called Blood in the Wind, and uh, that piece, very, very briefly, is about, I was watching a newscast in Kuwait, and it was talking about some skirmishes on the border with Iraq, and how there was a lot of bloodshed there. And the news anchor said, well, you know, we can't see it, but there's, there's blood in the wind. So this idea of kind of giving voice to violence is that we can't see. And Neduza Makatini is also a, a professor at Fort Hare University in South Africa. And they were having really violent protests mm -hmm. uh, where their students were speaking up. And, this, and the, you know, the police yeah. were very harsh on them. And then, so where do we leave this? We leave this with, of course, nobody else but Rumi. Uh, and I stumbled across this line that's, uh, where he wrote, uh, raise your words, not your voice. It's rain that brings flowers, not thunder. So that's kind of ending in this moment of grace after thinking about, you know, senseless violence and what do we, what do we leave with? We leave with grace. So um, it was just a very natural series of conversations, a great act of trust. I mean, I've never met him to do his own person. Although <clears throat> on April 14th, we're going to be playing music together at the Art Center, inshallah, for Ramadaniyat. Yes. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, he had to rent a theater in the height of this and put out a lot of money and uh, that he was lending me, we'd never met. So mm -hmm. there was so much trust involved in this, um, in this piece. And I think about trust and survival and the system of debts in the Western Indian Ocean, bringing it back to the sea of, of depending on each other and uh, being indebted to each other and trusting each other in order to make life possible. Thank you. I think with that, we will watch the video, um, and then that will be followed by a presentation by Dr. Aaron Lobo, which will, again, talk about the kind of globalized world. So we have come, as we promised, downriver into the ocean. Um, and so after the music, there will be food. So <laughs> we will let the music play on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. بيت الرسول مكة يا مدينة هلا بيت الرسول مكة يا مدينة بيت الرسول مكة يا هلا بيت الرسول 
makkayam jine betil el raso
Okay, very good evening to all of you. 
And uh, yeah, I think I'm going to end the day with some food for thought. So, um, and there's actually going to be a meal after this, so please stay on. Um, so I'd like to first thank uh, al Sarkal uh, Foundation, particularly Nada, Raza, and everyone who kind of put this incredible event together. I think this is so important where, you know, it's not just waters connecting us from mountains to the ocean, but it's really about interdisciplinarity, you know, getting all these different streams together from geographers to scientists to artists like Ghazi. I mean, we just spoke so much when we were sitting side by side. So it's, it's really interesting to have all these people together. Because I think like Vikram mentioned, these solutions have to be emotive. It just cannot be purely fact driven, you know. I mean, uh, the facts are very important. We need evidence, but we need uh, the emotion to lead us. And um, I'd just like to sort of um, go ahead with that. So um, as we take it from the sort of mountains to the ocean, I'm coming to a point where the ocean is connected and not just by music, which kind of connects us at an emotive level. It's we are very strongly connected by the food we eat. And I'm going to demonstrate uh, how this works. So um, Shahana and um, um, uh, Shahana and uh, Jean painted a really sort of um, important uh, image of the delta or the coastline, and which is the point where the river meets the sea. And now this is a point that it's been, like they said, you know, I mean, uh, mappers and planners have tried year after year to kind of map and say, where is the coastline? Where does this start? Where does this end? This was in the Indus Delta. And they've always struggled. Things have changed. You know, islands have moved. Uh, Saint, Sufi Saint temples have disappeared overnight. And this just shows the dynamic nature of this landscape. But as they also showed, traditional communities have kind of understood and they've worked with this for, for generations. So they know this dynamism. So I'm showing you the other side of the Indian uh, subcontinent, which is uh, this big sort of uh, delta, the largest delta in the world. It's called the Shondarbans, which is the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta. And what you can see here is a large number of rivers flowing out to sea. And if you look down there, there's this sort of milky white plume, which is actually sort of uh, brownish in color. It's a huge amount of sediment that's pushed into the rivers. OK, and with the sediment comes a lot of nutrients, comes a lot of food, uh, and comes a lot of uh, other stuff that's brought in. Because of this, this, this area is super rich in terms of the fish, the crabs, the diversity of a whole range of other species that come here to breed and feed. The Sundarbans also happens to be the largest contiguous mangrove forest in the world. It's like, it's, it's really large and it spans two countries. As I said, the delta is about 100,000 square kilometers. That's massive. But people's islands, homes are always in a state of flux. Traditional communities know this. Now, when this silt comes down, there's one fish of super importance in Bangladesh and in that region. It's called the Hilsa. And these fishermen follow the fish, basically. So you have this fish moving upriver and moving cross country. And the fishermen are just following the fish. So very often, they stray borders. And uh, you know skirmishes arise. Fishermen get arrested on either side. And this is not something that's kind of restricted between India and Bangladesh. It ha happens across all border states. You can talk about the Baltic. You talk about the Gulf of Manar along the southeast coast of India, where you have uh, the Park Straits, which are also very rich areas, also once important pearl diving areas, the Gulf of Manar and the Park Bay. So what's happening here is the fish don't recognize borders. Ecology doesn't recognize borders. And fishermen follow the fish. And but however, like, you know, I mean, like um, uh, Shahana um, and, um, yeah, and uh, they spoke about one, one of the things was very clear was basically we, we want to draw lines. We want to control and manage like we manage our terrestrial landscapes. Like every si single hectare of land is managed in some form or the other, whether it's like a grazing land or whether it's a revenue land or whether it is agricultural space or human habitation is managed in some form or the other. The ocean is largely kind of open a kind of open common, it's open access. But what you see here is we still try to manage it, and we have this maritime zones. 
You have the territorial waters that is about 12 nautical miles from shore for each country. You have the exclusive economic zone where a country has rights over its fishery, fishery resources and its continental shelf. Uh, that's under its jurisdiction, so we try and manage. But you cannot look at the sea as this 2D structure where you're just drawing a line over it. It's very 3D. You have, you know, trenches like the Mariana Trench in the South Pacific, which is over 2,000 odd meters, it's the deepest trench, and you have mountains that are taller than Mount Everest of Hawaii. So it's, it's really complex, and it's, it's kind of very diverse, but we still tend to want to control and manage in some way or the other. This is um, a, a Fanti man, his uh, name is Achiba, and I met him many years ago in 2012 when I was working in Liberia. And I asked him, you know, how did you come to Liberia? And he had his whole family over there. There was a place called the Big Fanti Town. And he told me it's like my whole family moved here, but I've actually got family not just in Liberia, I've got family in Guinea, I've got family in Cote d'Ivoire, I've got family in Mauritania. And he said, we are basically following the fish. We follow shoaling sardine up the coast, which kind of follow a particular current, uh, a current pattern, and we follow certain other kinds of tuna. And that's why we, we are just following the fish, so we go across country, we've got settlements across these countries. So it kind of, the, the moral here is fishermen do not recognize boundaries very often like the fish, they're just following the fish. These are traditional communities who understood tides and they were very tactile, like Shahana and John put it. They were very tactile. They, they, they literally threw plumb lines and they tasted, the, they tasted the, 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 the sediment and a whole range of things. So like this, you have Senegalese fishermen that kind of ply the entire Gulf of Guinea. You have fishermen from a small village in Tamil Nadu called Tutur that travel as far as Western Australia to go and catch sharks. They were shark fishermen exclusively. So you have these communities all over the world. But this has changed drastically over a period of time. So right now, as I said, you had that portion which is the high seas. The high seas is kind of the largest open access area you can think about. There are many laws to try and manage it, but it's really not enforced. So 60%, 67% of the ocean surface are the high seas. So you can go wherever you want, you can catch what you want, and you can bring it back to your country. Now it's very interesting that most of the goods that we use here, pretty much everything here, most of our food, the fuel that we use, everything comes by some form of container ship or a tanker. But it's also fisheries that's become heavily industrialized, wherein boats are not just restricted to coastal waters, you know, near shore. You go to a supermarket in Dubai and you have seafood not just caught in the Persian Gulf. You can have seafood caught as far as, uh, and we'll, we'll, uh, I'll demonstrate that further, but you have like, you know, mussels from the Netherlands, you could have, uh, a uh, hake from Chile, you could have salmon from Norway, you could have a whole range of species across. Okay, so we're really, uh, living in a very global world, and this becomes very difficult to tell you the real picture on the ground. So, you know, if, if there is no pearls in, in the Persian Gulf in Kuwait, you know, would you still, uh, you know, be restricted to the, just the pearls in Kuwait? I mean, there could be certain high value ones, but people will still want pearls, and you create a market for certain things in various places. So this is what I was talking about, you know, connecting through seafood because food unites us at a very sort of an emotive level. And that's what I'm going to try and demonstrate with two simple dishes. Okay, one of which comes from my state and the other one because I happen to be stuck in, a, in Spain for the last couple of months. <laughs> so I'm just going to show you a quick one. This is prawn curry rice and this is like a typical dish that you would have in Goa. But in Goa, we don't want the big, large prawns that you see, like, you know, that you see in the supermarkets. They want this particular kind of small prawn they call solar over here. And it's a particular species you also find in the Persian Gulf. It's a, a species called Metapeneus dobsoni. It's a little tiny prawn. And now what happens with, it, uh, with this shrimp is that you need to catch it with a particular kind of gear. It's a tiny shrimp. You see it's barely like a couple of centimeters, but it's really delicious. And you can only make prawn curry good when you use this prawn. No big tiger shrimp, none of those specific white leg shrimp, none of those. So it's just these small prawns. But to catch prawns, you need to use a, a kind of a, a gear or a craft called a trawler. Uh, how many of you here have heard of trawlers? Could you just raise your hands? Okay, great, everyone. So this is a simple three-cylinder trawler that I used to work on many years ago, early 2000s. And basically what it does is it just tows a net behind it as it moves along. And the net is like a windsock. 
with the mesh decreasing. Now imagine it's dragging the net along the floor because shrimp are bottom dwelling scavengers. They live on the floor, you know, eating what they can find. But when you do that, you're basically going through that very complex ecosystem I spoke about and you're picking up an entire ecosystem. So you want to see a marine ecosystem, you visit a fish landing site, you know what's being caught there. Now trawlers caught everything in their path, including the small prawns. Sometimes they didn't account for a, ma a majority of the catch, just a small portion of the catch. And very often it led to conditions like this, not very often, occasionally. So this is off the coast of Orissa, taken by another colleague of mine, a place called Gahir Mata, wherein hundreds of thousands of turtles, I mean not hundreds of thousands, about 150,000 turtles, come ashore to nest every year. It's the biggest olive ridley turtle rookery in the world. Now what happens is trawlers are still sort of plying outside and when they, when they congregate, sometimes you hit a big, um, a big group of turtles and they get caught. Now turtles are air breathing reptiles and they need air to breathe. So if you keep them submerged, they die. A trawler's net is stored for about three and a half hours. So basically submerging turtles for three and a half hours under immense stress, they suffocate. So it's not just turtles, it's dolphins, it's sea snakes. I counted over 500 and you know, 30 odd species when I was doing my work at that point of time. So it's a lot of stuff. So all these turtles were dead, but this is not the typical scene that you see here. Oops, sorry. What, what you see is a, a condition like this. So trawlers, at one point of time when I was working, this was taken back in 2002, they were discarding bycatch. Uh, this is the non-target species, so they wanted the shrimp, they wanted the cuttlefish, they wanted the squid, but everything else was cast overboard. But what I realized as I began to continue to work along the coast is that trend was changing. These were called discards. So discards looked completely unimportant to them because they were not of commercial value to the export markets but they were super important to local fishermen and they were damn important for the marine ecosystem as a whole. Every species is part of that big web. Okay, and this is a little shot from a, a, a little port in South India in a place called Nagapatnam. And this looks totally chaotic, but there's a lot of order in this madness. So the shrimp come out first and they're basically quickly packed and stored into export markets. This is the stuff that goes into distant domestic markets in India. This was shot in say about 2007, eight. Okay, and these are big rays. At one point of time, they had no value. They were cast, um, you know, they were cast overboard dead. But right now, they had value for their skin. So what was happening here? And then you had all these other fish being sold to the markets nearby. A uh, little barracuda, small snapper. And then you see this stuff, you know, this huge mounds of seafood, but was once discarded. It got a term in Tamil called kasar, which means uh, thrash or garbage and this is called trash fish in actual technical terms which is a really terrible word which actually includes an entire ecosystem as I said of species hundreds of species that I counted from seahorses to pipe fish to all kinds of stuff and there were these huge grounds that they were drying this stuff that they once discarded so I showed you that they were discarding in 2002 and earlier on discards were really heavy and trawlers got criticized globally for discarding and wasting protein that could be eaten by people, uh, resources that were super important for the ecosystem. And you can see the stuff is actually decomposing. But you know, what was giving this stuff its value? You know, why were they landing this stuff? What was the reason for this? So that kind of formed a big part of my, my PhD work in those days. And uh, you can see these women are actually sorting it out. The conditions are very difficult. It's about 42 degrees out there and they're packing into these gunny sacks and uh, they're taking it somewhere. But what was giving this, this stuff its value? Why were they sort of sieving through it? Why were they doing all this? And this is all a typical mound of trash fish, very fresh, just come aboard. But some of these trawlers keep it aboard on the side, not in ice for three days, so it's decomposing. But why were they landing this stuff? Why were they landing this low quality protein? I'm talking way back in 2008 again. And when you look at it, I followed these, uh, those big gunny sacks to the big poultry industry in the central part of India. Now, chickens and the industrial fishing, the trawling was growing at a very similar rate, you know, from the 1970s to around, um, say, the early 2000s, 2010, it was kind of growing really steep. And increasing affluence is also increasing the consumption in India of this kind of protein, which is, you know, um, relatively kosher compared to say, and, and less expensive as well. So it was going to, chicken, to, to the chicken farms. Now just to let you know, 
basically all this stuff is called fish meal. It's just ground. It's as simple as all feed for either chickens, a huge amount of it. Uh, so about quarter of all the seafood we catch in the globe, quarter of all the seafood we catch in the globe either goes to feed farmed fish. Okay, 70% of it goes to feed farmed fish. The rest of it goes to feed pigs and chickens. Okay, so that's a lot of seafood that animals are eating. And I could actually compare it, but I'll, I'll talk about that later. These are tilapias. Uh, these are, uh, you know, a species of genetically modified tilapia. It's called the gift tilapia. It was in a forest in, uh, just outside a mangrove forest in Matang. They were kept in little pens in the mangrove forest. And tilapia is found in Africa and in the Middle East but it's not native to many of these areas in, in Asia, but it's kind of like a chicken. It's kind of pretty much colonized the entire globe in the aquaculture sector, etc. And imagine a huge amount of wild caught feed going to produce, you know, captive fish. Like a salmon requires an average of about 2.5 kilos to produce a kilo of salmon. That's a conversion ratio. So it's a huge amount. It doesn't make any sense, you know, using that much of fish to kind of, to, to make more fish. And also you lose diversity because it's all monoculture. And also pigs, there's a huge amount of fish, like for example, lots of big factory uh, ships going down the coast of West Africa and Mauritania catching tons of sardines, which are then just dried. Uh, literally there are solar panels, many development organizations have been involved in this. I mean, uh, drying this fish, pulping it, and basically uh, selling it as fish meal to feed pigs. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the second dish. I'm done with this one. And uh, this is while I was, uh, stuck in, um, I was stuck in Spain under uh, like an unfortunate circumstance that happened. Basically, I got robbed. And, and what happened uh, over there was um, I decided I'm going to try as much of, you know, food and a lot of seafood as well. So I went after the paella. Now, obviously, everyone who goes to Spain wants to try the paella. But the traditional paella is not the paella, the marisco, which is the one with the seafood. It was from the Valencian region or the broader Catalan region. And they used everything from rabbit to snail to whatever they could find in the area around their fields. But today, this is the paella that you kind of see on pictures and it's seen on guidebooks, etc. Now, if I want to break down this paella, what you see here is mussels. Uh, you see the langoustines or the scampi over there. And you see another shrimp there, very interestingly, another prawn that I'm going to be talking about now. Okay, and the mussels came, I found out they came from the Ebros River Delta, which is just between Valencia and, um, and Barcelona on the East Coast. And mussels are great because they're filter feeders. You don't require to feed them. They're actually a great service. So always, I mean, mussels are always a great choice to eat, depending on, you know, unless you're getting them from really polluted waters, which can make you very sick. So, yeah. And these are the langoustines. They were caught uh, either from the Mediterranean or they came from um, the North Sea. But a lot of it is caught in the Mediterranean as well. And it's kind of a managed fishery, although the Mediterranean as a whole is, uh, is one of the most overfished seas in the world. And then we have this interesting shrimp, as I showed you. But this was something called the Pacific white leg shrimp. Now, if you go to any supermarket here, you go to Europe, you go to the US, you'll find the Pacific white leg shrimp. Now, this shrimp originates actually along the central coast of the Pacific side of Mexico all the way down to Peru. Okay, it didn't exist anywhere. It was only caught by trolls. But in about the late 1970s, it was being farmed in the US and then it spread like wildfire across the globe because it was one that was not as prone to disease as say the tiger shrimp. And they brought it to India and India is one of the biggest producers today. It happened over the last decade of Pacific white leg shrimp, which, which has flooded the market in, um, in many parts. But to grow shrimp, very often, you need to clear vast swathes of mangroves. This is a place in West Bengal in India, where you're just clearing vast swathes of mangroves. There's monoculture of casuarina, which is Australian pine that you don't find there. And this area, which was very diverse, those rivers were diverse with lots of small scale fisheries, have none of that. There are few people working on these farms. And it's grown, it's grown, it's used to grow the langostis now. There's always advice to eat lower down the food web, and shrimp are lower down the food web, and not eat the predators like the hamur. You know, try and avoid the hamur, the shark, etc., and go down the food web more towards the clams, the mussels, the shrimp. But then, if you see where they're caught from, 
So the point is, it's not so straightforward for me to tell you that eat this and not that, because there's a lot of nuance that goes into telling, to making these conclusions. And so the answer is basically, should we stop eating seafood or what should we do? You know, I, I mean, I know I've told you a couple of, uh, a couple of depressing stories, but I can, clearly, I can clearly tell you something that basically uh, stopping seafood is not going to save the ocean. In fact, uh, one, of the, one of the ways forward is actually being a nuanced consumer because if you look at it, a lot of our seafood is being driven to the animal feed industries, you know, and it's, it's not going for human consumption, all perfectly fine for human consumption. Fisheries provide livelihoods to millions of people around the world. Many of them are solely dependent on fish as their sole source of protein and uh, important source of micronutrients, particularly for young children and, um, you know, and and many of these communities that are deprived. Okay, so we need more, uh, we need to make structural changes and this can only happen through policy. And structural changes in our policy is the only way we can affect uh, fisheries. And you as a consumer could help by kind of being more aware and not just looking at a wallet card because there's a lot of complexity behind that wallet card. I know it's very, like my mom asked me, okay, so you, yesterday you told me that this is bad, but I said, oh, you know, I mean, it's changed a bit now. You need to kind of, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so yeah. So basically, the the answer is it is a bit complicated. But at one time, one point of time, you had the you had the chance to engage with the vendor. You went to the market in Dubai. You went to Almena in uh, Abu Dhabi. You could actually engage with the vendor, ask him from where he got the buri or where he got the bolti. You know, he would tell you. So basically, now you cannot. It's it's very difficult for him to tell you. And there's a lot of um, there's a lot of imposters in the marketplace. You go to uh, Portugal today, and you can get pej espada or uh, espadart which is the swordfish, but it's actually, uh, what they're selling you is the Espada Preto, which is this black scabbard fish that's caught using line off the coast of Madeira, which is another fish that is kind of sustainable now, but it's quickly going to change, but because swordfish stocks have collapsed in many parts of this world. So there's a lot of misnaming and a lot of imposters in the marketplace to be aware of, and we can talk more about it. That's a little Guinean tilapia and um, this young boy in, in um, in one of the highlands in Guinea who caught this fish at that point of time. And these are super important fish, these small fish, because you consume the entire fish, bones, organs, and all. And at the end, it's really about uh, ensuring the structural changes are very important, particularly to ensure labor rights and human rights and fisheries. As resources go down, the life of coastal communities is getting particularly hard. As I showed you, many of these people who are thrash sorting came from the artisanal or the small scale fisheries that could not make a living because the seafloor has just been scraped off of all the fish. They were not concerned about shrimp, they ate all kinds of fish, they had a diversity, they ate seasonally, they moved across borders to eat. So basically this changed a lot. And um, yeah, with that I'd just like to end over here, but what I would like to tell you is that uh, soon after this we've got this little gastronomic experience that we are doing with Chef Tomazzini. Uh, who's at the Brazil Pavilion. So I would like you all to sort of please join us over there because we're going to be looking at each dish and it's not about giving you clear answers again, it's about giving you the nuance in it. Uh, but I would, I would love if you'll ask me any questions now because we have time for questions and you know, we specifically kept time for that. So thank you very much for listening and it was a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Nada. We, we hear about regenerative farming, right? Yep. With technology today, is it possible to have regenerative, regenerative fish farming so that we regenerate ecosystems? Sardines, for instance, in Brazil are gone. And how can we rebuild the ecosystems, the marine life, while making livelihoods and profit? Um, that's a very important question. Where are you from, sir? I'm from Brazil, Sao okay. Paulo. Okay, thank you. Now, that's a really important question. And basically, um, as I was just saying, 46% of all the fish we consume today comes from the farm fishing sector. So it's a very big 
And so if you really have to make changes, we have to look at the aquaculture, the farming, the farm fish industry. And there's a lot of regenerative models, like Vikram was saying about uh, the Mekong, where a lot of area had been cleared of mangroves, is now being regenerated. And a lot of the people are recognizing their old traditional systems and building on those systems by planting mangroves, but not just one species, recognizing diversity. One of the key things here is to recognize diversity, not just in planting the mangrove species, but also in the species that grow in that. Because now the big problem with aquaculture farms is you just grow like say, you know, the piraruku, or you can grow the Asian sea bass, or you can grow the robalio, whatever it is. But here you need diversity. So they're recognizing something that's nature positive. Like I showed you that man who was holding those fish in his hand, he catches those small fish because of the reed beds. If he didn't have those reed beds, he wouldn't get the diversity. Now that small fish is very nutritious, particularly because they eat the entire fish, you know, bones, organs and all. And um, another, so th that adds another point, is a lot of these farms in Bangladesh, which has got some great models, are adding these small fish to big carp monocultures, simply to make these farms more nutritionally sensitive, so that po coastal communities can get access to this cheaper and easier available protein. And we are going to have to look at that. Uh, there are also, like, in, in terms of regenerative farming, thinking about mussels, uh, oysters, there's a great example in the Persian Gulf in Musandam, I think in uh, the Strait of Hormuz, where they're doing this, the Dibba Bay oysters. Uh, so there's a great example, because they are filter feeders, they don't require too much feed. So thinking lower down the food web and thinking about a regenerative system is, is a must. We have to do that, there's no option. Anyone else? And please tell me from where you're all, because there's always something to kind of, uh, you know, when it comes to fish, there's always something to relate to. Uh, yes? Uh, hi, hello. I'm from uh, the US. And something you were talking about, um, you mentioned, you know, how global high seas is. And I was thinking about um, how difficult that makes regulation um, and how difficult that makes, because it's such an international issue, like you were talking about the um, fishermen that cross borders. So what are some ways that you're thinking about of regulating this and like fish farming and also ocean trawling and those kinds of things internationally? Because like things like the UN can be effective, but things like NGOs can also be effective in different ways. So what solutions to sort of global regulation have yeah. you been thinking about and do you think are effective? Yeah, so the, um, that's a really important question and basically it's a one that a lot of people have actually been really breaking their heads over. Like, you know, there's a, there's a new discussion for a new high seas treaty, which I don't think has reached any sort of, um, um, it's, it's not really reached a very clear decision as to I think how things are supposed to go and they're very difficult to regulate. Now you have these bodies called the uh, Regional Fisheries Marine Organizations, called the RFMOs, that try to manage uh, you know, large areas around them. Like in the Indian Ocean, you have the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission, you have one for the Atlantic. And they're not very effective because it's very difficult to enforce them. So they have observers on board, but even then it's, there's a lot of stuff that happens at the high seas that just goes unchecked. Um, uh, yes, I would say that one of the things uh, we, need to th we, we need to kind of be certain for, like a, um, uh, the, the, the gentleman who's the architect earlier who pointed out, you know, we cannot ignore the fact that we live in the globalized world. So we definitely need to kind of put checks and balances over there while also strengthening the local systems like they're doing in Vietnam. They did a great job in, in, uh, in uh, Myanmar as well with the trap. They've got an old system called the trap and hold system which basically allows flood waters to come into these particular big uh, uh, fields. They grow mangroves there. And then the government provisions them with uh, young crabs uh, and hatcheries for these people to kind of, you know, there, so there's some input for them. And basically that's one of the best forms because they know the, they have the traditional knowledge there and you're just sort of helping beef that up and creating some other incentives. You know, that's the whole point of, doing something like that. You have to build on traditional, or you have to build on capacities that exist, and don't try and create a parallel system. That's the most important thing to follow. Um, the high seas, uh, you know, as you rightfully said, are a massive challenge, and I think 
it'll, it'll require a lot more push, a lot more political push from various governments. The EU itself, you know, fishes pretty much globally. You know, you have uh, Portuguese and, you know, uh, Spanish fleets going to the Indian Ocean, catching yellowfin tuna. Uh, the Pacific has done a great job with, you know, charging huge rents for fishers who come there. So the islanders have made a good amount of uh, money from it, and they managed to regulate the fishery sustainably. So you can have sustainable fisheries. It's not like you can't have. You know, so you're basically, if you're able to sort of incentivize communities and give them agency, I think that's the most important thing you can do. Um, okay, so I, if there's no other questions, I think we're sort of uh, done for time. So uh, we can move over there. And if you have any other questions, I think, you know, when you, when you eat stuff, there'll be, you know, it's tactile, as Shahana said. So there's a lot of stuff that'll come to mind. Thank you very much.